it is a day like no other day. So again, use this brochure. Please invite your friends and family to come along. And on your seat in your front pocket, there's a connection card, just as Justin was praying before the stage, that every week we take your time filling out. Um, if you're making out, I would love you to fill out still your name, your emails, or if you have any change of contact. If you have any prayer requests, we'd love you to fill in. We'd love to actually pray for you, pray with you, and we pray over each and every prayer request every week, and we also give praise to the Lord for what He's doing in your life. And on the bottom, my next step today is to, so we have a water baptism coming up in April the 22nd. Who's excited? Yeah, isn't that great? We have Easter, then water baptism. So if you've never been water baptized before, we'd love you to register and we'll have a little study class with Robbie after the service. So give us some details. I'll just give you a time for you to fill out. And while you're filling that out, in the same section you find your connection card, you find your offering envelopes. So this morning I was thinking, we don't just come prepared to give the Lord our finance. We do this every week in, in honoring what God's giving to us. We don't just come preparing our money in the envelope or epos, you know, going, you can do that at the information desk online, but we come and prepare our hearts what we're about to bring to the Lord. And I just want to read the scripture this morning to remind us of what we're doing, why are we bring our giving into his house. So, Jeremiah 29, 11, very well-known scripture in his house. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you our future and hope. So God's plan for us all, not just you and I, but for our family, friends. It's not just that, even extending, go outside of our church, in our community, in our city, into the world. God's plan for each and every one of us is full of goodness, full of hope. And we as a church have been called to carry the message of hope. So if you are part of this church, you are actually part of that calling. And I'm really convinced each one of us carry the message of hope and we do a doing thing, daily things in the school, at the work, in the shopping centre. But as we bring our offering, when we are bringing our finance in the storehouse, we as a church can reach out into our community in a more impacting way together. Together we can lead to more people with a message of a hope. That's why we do what we do every week, because we believe. You know, this scripture, this letter was given to the people, the God's people, in the times of exile. The God's people were in the captives in Babylon. It wasn't a very good time for them. It was a dark, dark time for them. Yet God spoke over them. God prophesied over them saying, Yet I have a plan of your life. You might be in a bad place right now, but I have a plan of your life. And my plan for you is full of goodness and full of hope. And this is a message we carry in the heart as a whole church. You know, this is a message we need to go into the world because the world needs a hope. Our world needs a hope. So as we are preparing our giving, I want to pray us over it. You know, because we want to bring that with a heart prepared, knowing God's going to use everything that we bring into the storehouse for His purpose to bring a message of hope into the world. So Father, we just thank you for this time together. God, we just thank you for everything that you're giving to us. Thank you for the provision over each and every one of us. But God, this morning, we bring with a grateful heart that our giving, our offering to your house, Lord Jesus. And we ask for you to multiply and use for your purpose, Lord. Father, we just pray that every giving that's being gathered in this house, that you will use to take the message of hope into our community, into our world, to restore hope and bring healing in the name of Jesus. What a powerful name, the beautiful name of Jesus, Lord. And we pray that in the precious name. Amen. Let's stand and worship as we give.
that we can come in the powerful name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, as we gather around your word, Holy Spirit, we pray that the ministry of your living word would do us good. Lord, that you would transform us more into the likeness of your Son. We pray that your word will penetrate deep into every aspect of our hearts and being, Lord. Lord, that healing may occur at the sound of your word. The same word that spoke the universe into being. Jesus, you, the living word, become manifest in our life more and more. So we pray that you would open the ears and the eyes of our hearts. That our hearts would be receptive soil for the seed of your word to be implanted and bring forth good fruit that you may receive all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, church. You be seated. Youth, you've got zeal happening. The King James Version says, never flag in zeal. I like it, sounds German. Never flag in zeal, yeah. <laughs> it means don't lose your zeal, don't lose your passion. Well, we are concluding our message series called Hope and Healing, and I'm excited about the new series called Different. And when we're preparing this word, some of it actually overlaps with different. So I, I thought, Holy Spirit, you know, you're so on the ball. Um, we have received, as Pastor Justin has said, many encouraging reports of people already being completely healed from various afflictions. I mean, we have had frozen shoulders completely restored right there and then at the altar. We've had a backache completely restored. I mean, they could do, you know, change phone aerobics after that. So we still do that? I don't know. All right? Um, but today's message, the, the, the concluding message, is titled, Wait for It. And to understand why it's called that, you will need to wait for it until the end. And it all makes sense. Experiencing God healing people is something I got introduced to right away when I first got saved at 40 years of age in 1994 in Singapore. I mean, I went to a church that believed, that preached, that prayed the healing of God, and I saw it happen. You know, I remember our senior pastor's wife, she was diagnosed with breast cancer, and we prayed for her, and she got healed miraculously. The doctor said she wouldn't make it, she made it. And you know, I remember the first time when I laid hands on someone, I was a new Christian, you know, just two months into it, I prayed, and someone gets healed, and I'm like, oh, I felt like Iron Man with his plastic gun, I'm like, oh, Monday, Baramonde, oh, I mean, it was like, I felt I was a superhero, I'm like, come on, sickness, make my day. You will be terminated, sickness. I mean, it was, it was exciting. You laid hands on the sick and they got healed. I'm like, this is fun. I'm loving this. So that, that is how I started. But from the very beginning, as a new Christian, I had a, a simple, childlike faith that had no doubt whatsoever that God heals people in response to faith. I mean, that, that is my background. That's where I come from. But then one day, something interesting happened. Back in Singapore, I had a very good friend named David. Not this David, another David. And uh, we, we used to play basketball together. He was a Christian. And one day, I noticed he couldn't dribble very well. As in not dribbling on his mouth like a drummer, but as in dribbling with the hands, okay? And we thought, oh, he just injured himself. He went to the doctors to check it out, and we found out that he had a malignant brain tumor. Bad brain tumor. And the brain tumor was pushing on a certain part of the brain that connected the nerves to the hands so he couldn't move. And my friend David went to the best doctors. I mean, they went, they even flew to Boston, to the world's best uh, 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 brain cancer specialists, all right? And he received chemotherapy, he received uh, radiotherapy. And when he came back, I couldn't recognize him. He, had, he was a little scrawny guy, but he blew up with steroids. His entire face and, and neck was burned from the radiotherapy. And I remember one time, I was visiting him in hospital, and he was so excited to see me. And I get there, and because of his, his sickness and, and the drug side effect, he was too tired. And I remember that sad look in his face, looking at me saying, 
it's not fair. And I'm like, that's it. That's it. You, you, you made a German angry right here. I, I'm declaring war on this cancer. And so you know, I'm, about, I'm going to pray for you. And his, his parents were there. My, my dad was there who brought me. Because I didn't have driver's license. I was about 15. I laid hands on him. And, and I called upon every single archangel in heaven. I bound every demon in hell. I mean, I pulled all the shakabundis, the baramundis, the shikara, the honda. I mean, you name it. I, I gave it hell. I, like, I gave it heaven. All right? I mean, I, I prayed my guts up. And I came. <laughs> Satan, bite the dust. All right? I'm like, yeah, he's going to get healed. So that year, I went to Germany to visit my family. And then I get an email from another friend of a scanned copy of David's obituary. My friend, Christian friend who loved Jesus, died of brain cancer. What do you make of this? And it wasn't the only time that something this happened. There were other times when I prayed with earnest faith that God would heal others or myself, and yet it appeared that healing didn't occur. Do you remember three weeks ago when I preached and started this series, I said it is in God's nature to heal anything. So the question is, why are there times when healings do not happen? And this situation makes some Christians very uncomfortable because they feel that raising this issue is being negative. It sows doubt in our mind. It destroys the very atmosphere of faith needed to receive healing. And so they would rather avoid thinking about this difficult matter. But that does not help people like my friend David. It does not help people like myself who pray with sincere, deepest faith for God, for healing, and didn't experience it. It is the elephant in the room that many do not want to talk about. But it needs to be addressed if we talk about healing. Now, that's a picture of me on the right. I know where. <laughs> when I was a young Christian, all right, that was, that was the, the crazy Christian. Still, I'm crazy. But. And then there are other Christians, and again, I'm not trying to make fun of them. I, I realize they mean well, okay? They mean well. Uh, we can mean well and still be not quite right, but they mean well. Other Christians believe that if only we have enough faith for healing and verbally declare it out loud with our mouths, then we should always be healed and therefore never be sick and never suffer. And, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, but just shortly, this is based on what is called the health and wealth gospel. It's, it's known as positive confession, word of faith, or positive thinking. Now, interestingly enough, we do not find this teaching from the apostles who penned the New Testament under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You know why? Because they were kind of busy getting hunted, beaten, imprisoned, suffering, and executed for being Christians. And so the message of your best life now does not work when people roll up in mobs with rocks to throw at you every other day. The health and wealth gospel has its origin with this guy on the left, Phineas Quimby. He was a US non-Christian spiritual teacher from the 19th century. And he popularized what was called the New Thought Movement. New thought is basically this. Positive thinking, followed by positive speaking and confession, will produce positive results. In other words, if you think